Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is series one, episode three. Uh, today is Essentials of Typography in Marketing. So we're going to get started straight away. It's obviously an 18 minute uh, webinar. I'll be trying to stick to that. Um, there will be a couple of points where we're going to ask for a little bit of engagement in the chat, um, just for a bit of fun. Another one's for a prize. Um, so fastest fingers first on some of that. Um, but I'll get started. So there's a countdown here, one, two, three, four, five to start. Any of you who are a bit more of a connoisseur in typography will notice there's a big gap between the one and the two. This is just the typeface that has been selected. This is the way this typeface works. It seems to have a big gap between its one because it's a smaller character. This is something that should be fixed up in any typography. So even though it's a subtle shift of moving it closer together, the second version is obviously way better because we've kerned our typography. And a few of you might think, well, Dave, come on, that's not all that important. It's just one, two, three, four, five. It doesn't really matter. But we'll show some social proof where it really does matter that your kerning in typography has been done well. This is the first one. It's not a great space in the second word, which is going to cause them major problems. Another one here for click lovers. Again, the kerning completely wrong on this. Um, same applies to some of the Tesco delivery vans as well, where they've got click and collect. The kerning on that's pretty poor, I believe. And also this um, local pub, um, the wig and pen is open for business. Um, again, just kerning can cause problems um, out there in the real world. So even though the the number one that I showed at the start might seem like a marginal, minimal thing to actually rectify. It becomes really important when you're crafting typography and making sure that your message is coming across clearly. And then it goes even further to like brands like Nivea. So this is just their logo, but at some point they'll have commissioned someone to produce a brand identity, which obviously includes a logo. And then the kerning in here is pretty poor to be fair for a, a major global brand. Um, you know, the gap between the N and the I is absolutely massive compared to the other letters. Um, a lot of them are closer together and the N needs to be kerned a lot closer to the I. So it's, it's a real shame to see when there's only five letters that someone can't craft the typography properly for a major brand like this. And then that moves us into something called line lengths. So again, in the digital space, line lengths can vary dramatically from a web page to a mobile phone. But Baymard here conduct research across comms in a digital space. And the best space to try and fit in is somewhere between 50 and 75 characters as a line length. And then you should have a return. And um, the first one can be deemed too short, but I'm not too fussed about that one because that's more likely to be seen on a mobile device. And the third one is what you should avoid where your text is going from left to right across the computer screen. You're just making it really hard for people to read what you've, what you've put down in a blog or an article. It puts them off going through that process. So you're trying to aim for that middle one where possible. And then long line lengths or short line lengths can lead to bad endings as well. So you'll see in the first one there's a happy face. You're trying to look at the end on the right hand side and make the line as smooth as possible. The other ones, as you can see, op, um, versions two and three, the line is really wiggly along the end which causes a problem when you're trying to read. It slows you down um, in the process of reading these paragraphs. And it's little things like this, like a, the word to or be or is, really small words being at the end of a line when they should be shifted onto the next line. It looks like they're gonna fall if you treat it like a gravitational pull. And then the final one being the word so, it's the start of a new sentence, but it's also just been left hanging on the end so when you're crafting type, you know, in the digital world, it's a little bit harder to control in a web space, but if you're doing a downloadable brochure or you're doing some printed literature or you're doing a social post or whatever it is that you're doing that's a bit more fixed, these are the things that you should be looking out for to make your message clearer. Then that moves into alignment. You've got left aligned text, which is quite commonplace. And the reason that works well is because all the, the sentences start with a sharp edge on the left-hand side. So it's an easier starting point every time you start a new line to be able to read it. Whereas right aligned, for me, should be used maybe a bit in a bit more of a creative space, maybe in some kind of magazine design or a poster design or something like that, but not in 
massive waves of content because you're starting from a different point on the line all the time, making it harder for someone to read the content. You can see it there in that line. It's just a wavy start compared to the left aligned text. Then you move into center aligned, which is becoming a bit more commonplace in the digital space. Um, it can work quite well, as you can see in that copy, it's not too hard to read. But again, it's just making sure that it's used appropriately where it needs to be and trying to use left aligned text where you can. And then justified text in the digital space, I would avoid it at all costs because you can't control the type as much as you can when it comes to print. In print, this justified text I'm showing here is pretty bad to be fair. Um, and you can spend time crafting every single line to make sure that it's justified properly, but it is an art form to go through it. These pink lines here that I'm showing you show what we call rivers. You get a white space going through the type because you've just justified the whole lot and not crafted every single line. So in the digital space, I'd just avoid it. If you're crafting something for a download or print, then you can actually do something with it. And then things to watch out for that are creeping in the digital space all the time now. Um, things like a, le a letter or word being sat on its own, we should avoid that at all costs where we can. And also on the right hand column, a new sentence starting, which is actually associated to the paragraph before. So you're trying to avoid that and make sure that those two are associated to each other again, making it easier to read your message. And then it goes through to other things like a big famous logo like this for a TV program. If you look at the word Britons, that is actually classed as a footmark. So if it's five foot two inches, you have a footmark and an inch mark, which are straight lines. So somewhere someone sent this over to a designer, the designer's not noticed that the footmark is in it and then crafted this whole render over two or three days and left a footmark in rather than the apostrophe that would come with that typeface. And that happens in a few places. I'm a celebrity used to have it um, in their type as well. And this is coming from like word documents being sent to a designer, but then the designer not being knowledgeable enough to notice that they're using a footmark or an inch mark instead of actually putting an apostrophe in for the typeface. So they're things that we look out for, make sure they're rectified. And then the big hoo-ha online was when Levi's suggested a change of the logo, um, not just because of the logo, but because the type was pretty poor, the kerning between the V and the I where they both touch. But the main thing that got all the news online was the fact, again, instead of the apostrophe for the typeface being applied, uh, the footmark graphic had just been left in instead. And that's something that just shouldn't happen. You, know, you should avoid that in, in all of the communication that you do, make sure the right characters are being used. Happens in Costa Coffee, if you're connecting to their internet, you can see it in the You're Connected bit. Equally, the typography layout here, they could have chosen where that type went. So it could have been sat within the glass and made it a bit more legible, but instead they've kind of got it fighting with the edge of the glass instead. So it's about where you lay out your type as well. And then LD ads here, they've got quite a cheap typeface, but that's fair enough because they're trying to show that they're a cheap brand. Um, but again, they're using a footmark in the, the word we're rather than um, an apostrophe again. And then the word amazing, which should be kind of celebrated, has chosen to go in white on a very soft gray background. So just making it difficult to read the message that they want to try and get across. Then we move into like upper versus lower case and why one should be used over the other and when to use it. So this is a movement over time for me. A lot of brands have started with caps typefaces for their logo and over time have moved to upper and lower case. I think it's a movement um, because brands have become more accessible. People can communicate with brands through social media. Um, that there's been a movement from going from caps letters to upper and lower case letters to make them feel a little bit more friendly, a bit more approachable as a brand. And there's more legibility in um, upper and lower case compared to uh, cap letters as well. So we're going to prove that here. If you can throw in the comments what you think this word is. So everybody said touch. Okay, so the word touch is coming through, which I thought might be the case. This just proves that the word actually is tough. So upper and lower case clearly is easier to read because you basically look at the top of the words when you're reading a sentence, you don't read the whole letter. You just look across the top as you're reading a book or a blog. An upper and lower case is more distinctive. So it just makes it easier to read. 
rather than using caps letters. So caps letters are fine for certain areas, but you wouldn't want to write loads of paragraphs of copy in, in caps letters because you're making it hard for someone to read. It's not the natural way that you would read text. And this is kind of proof of that. And then we look at a brand called Lidl, obviously uses caps letters, quite playful, cheap colors, what you'd expect, but just showing how changing type, stripping things back, simplifying something, you could end up having a completely different feel to a brand. So this could be a high-end fashion brand now if we didn't know the, the name Lidl so well as a, a cheaper supermarket. And typography can give that perception straight away by making sure you're picking the right typeface and giving it the space that it requires. And then we could change that to something like that instead. It might be kind of a contemporary furniture store or, or something similar. We could change it again which might make you feel of maybe like Swiss chocolate or maybe an Italian restaurant or something. And then finally, something quite playful. So this might be like for little people, it might be a play area or a nursery or something similar. Um, but it's the same four letters just being used with very different typefaces and instantly gives off a completely different feeling. And then we move into brands um, that we're more familiar with. So this was, um, posted a little while ago on social media, but it was showing the movement of all these high-end fashion brands that had quite distinct identities to start with, all still felt quite premium on the left-hand side. And they've all moved towards this Sans um, approach to typography, um, all in caps as well, uh, which has just become a bit of a movement and a trend, but they obviously lose their distinction with that. Um, so, it's not necessarily about following trends when it comes to typography as well. You're trying to pick the typeface, one to be distinctive, but be reflective of the brand that you're trying to be and make sure that the positioning of the typography is suiting what you want to try and say to people. So now we're going to play just a little bit of a game. The first bit is for, for fun. The prize comes in a little bit. And all I want you to do in the comments really is out of these um, left or right, basically, which one would you say is cheap? So just pick one left or right. You just want to say which one you believe is cheap by saying left or right. So everyone is saying right, every every single person. Okay, great. Um, so that, that's fine. We'll come back to that one in a second. Same again, left or right, which one do you believe is cheap? Oh, everyone but two are saying left. Okay, so we'll come back to that one in a little bit as well. And then we're going to do a third one, which is even even split the room in the studio as well, to be fair. But whoever's fastest on this one, it's going to be cheap or expensive. Again, well, I want you to say cheap left or right. Um, and you can win this book on uh, typography on the web, which is a really important thing to, to fully understand. So here we go. The next slide's about to come. Uh, basically just do what you've done before. You're looking for the cheap one. We've got a real mix, a real yeah. mix there between left and right. Okay. So we thought that might be the case. We thought it might be a bit of a split there. Um, whoever's got the cheap one right and was fastest, they're going to win that book. So Amy can have a quick look at that, see if she can work it out. I'll continue with um, the final part of the, the presentation. So this was always going to be a trickier one, um, but there's a bit more craft to one than the other one. So we'll go back through them. So the first one actually is exactly the same brand, but you all picked the right one being cheap. And it's just an example of Virgin Atlantic is ultimately a premium brand. Obviously, the Virgin brand is a little bit fun across all that it does, but it is a premium brand at the end of the day. And even within their own brand and identity and the campaigns that they do, they quite often change the typeface or the, the weight of the typeface or the size of the typeface to the point where, for me, I think it's detriment to the overall brand. And it just, again, shows how typography plays a massive part in your visual identity, but your overall positioning um, and all of you jumped at the, the fact that this was going to be a cheap one on the right. It turns out it's exactly the same brand, which is a bit disappointing for, for Virgin Atlantic as a brand and, and how that brand's being managed from a typographic perspective. The next one, two supermarkets, 
Um, the difference was Asda and MNS food. So a subtle difference, but again, it comes down to a bit of refinement in this case, just the, the layout of the, the caps letters on the right hand side and the spacing um, just gives it a, a little bit more clarity, makes it feel a little bit more premium where you'll see on the left hand side, the letters are pushing into each other. They're in different weights and different sizes. Um, the, the, the typeface itself is a little bit cheaper than the one on the right. And that's the overall feel that it gives off. And then the final one, which was the one that split, was Primark and Diesel. So the Diesel one, obviously, is a more expensive brand. Um, it is being a bit more bold in the fact it's bright yellow um, and it's using a bolder Caps typeface. Um, but it's just more crafted and more refined than the other one that you could probably type in in an email um, or in a Word document or something similar. So that was the one we wanted to split. That was the biggest challenge. Um, was there a winner, Amy? Yes. Yeah, I think the winner was Emma Townend. So congratulations. Well done, Emma. We'll, we'll, we'll buy that book and get it out to you. Amy will catch up for your address and so forth afterwards. And then just to finally finish off with a couple of minutes to go, I just wanted to kind of do a little mini case study on the BBC. The BBC changed their font over the last couple of years. Um, and it was changed and it ended up being a bespoke font um, made for the BBC. Uh, but they went through a big process of doing that. And it mainly become their fonts were different across different devices and different platforms. And they wanted to make sure that it was uniform across everything. Um, but it also needs to speak to a lot of different people, a lot of different audience, a lot of different age groups, a lot of different people accessing and using different ways. So they went through a number of different things, looked at other fonts that already exist and the pros and cons of these fonts, you know, how legible are they on screen and what size should you use them, which one should be a heading, which one should be body copy. And they went through the whole of that process and ended up with a, a kind of one font, but it had a sans version and a serif version. It was called uh, BBC Wreath after one of the founders. Um, but it was the clarity of the typeface using the serif one for headlines and the sans one for body copy to make sure that it worked in all of their output across all the different platforms that they've got. But they looked specifically at every little bit of the letter. So where they are finished and how far it should curve over. What is the size of the space inside the D? How open was the C? And all of that help towards legibility. So at different point sizes on different devices and different screens and different age groups, different demographics, both fonts have complete clarity and legibility. So that's just a little case study to say how far some companies will go with typography. Obviously, it's, some of that will be based on a budget, but the BBC worked through it thoroughly to make sure that the font was appropriate for their brand and their platforms that they, they produce any content for. So I'm not expecting all of you to go with that far necessarily, but it's just to prove the fact that type is massively important. It's underrated for me in a lot of cases and that we just need to take more care when managing our brands as to what fonts we pick, what weights we pick, and just make sure that by doing the right things, ultimately your marketing message is gonna cut through. So that's it, I think 18.24 looking at my clock. Um, it goes quite fast. Uh, so hopefully we've, um, giving you a little bit of insight into typography there. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to reach out to us um, and we'll answer them. We've recorded this, so we'll be sending that out to you all anyway. Um, and thanks for attending. Um, and we'll no doubt see you on the next one.